And uh, we are going to be in Acts 19. I'm going to read that uh, in a moment, verse 11 through 20. Uh, But I want to tell you about a man who lived a while ago, a long time ago, really. Uh, He sought to be satisfied with the world's ways, philosophies of paganism. And he spent the first few decades of his life being fulfilled with these things by a variety of different thinkers. His first official teacher was a Stoic, Stoic philosopher. And yet this man, he would later write about, didn't really care much about the true God and didn't really even think the true God was necessary. This was not acceptable, so he moved on because he was looking for ultimate truth. He moved to another man, a different philosopher, a man who kind of traveled around, itinerant guy. But he was more interested in fees and kind of charging and just making a buck. This was short-lived for our subject. He then moved to another teacher that required a lot of prerequisites that we would call today, similar, just kind of, oh, you got to do these basic things. And he wanted to get to the core, the meat of the matter. He further moved to another guy, a Platonist, so after the teachings of Plato, though this was a few hundred years after Plato. And it lasted a little while, but it wasn't until around A.D. 130, when this man was about 30 years old, that he was satisfied in Christ. He had a deep gospel conversation with an old Christian man. He spoke of that time later on and saying, A fire suddenly kindled in my soul. I felt a love for the prophets and these men who had loved Christ. I reflected on all their words and found that their philosophy, this one of Christ, alone was true and profitable. This is how and why I became a philosopher, and I wish that everyone felt the way I do, end quote. So let us think for a moment, don't let our modern ears think and hear philosophy and automatically mean bad, you know, red alert, flags, no. Paul, of course, writes to the Colossian church in chapter 2, says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world. The point there is don't be captured by the world, be captured by Christ, the philosophy of Christ, the, the worldview of Christ. We use worldview today more than philosophy, but we still talk about it, right? What's your philosophy of education, your philosophy of ministry, your, your philosophy of work, and on and on. And philosophy, in one sense, is just a tool like fire. It's good in the wood stove or the campground, right, with marshmallows and chocolate, making s'mores. But it's horrible on your drapes, right, or at the edge of a dry forest. Fire isn't good or bad, neither is philosophy. Bad philosophy, hear me, versus good philosophy, glorifying, honoring philosophy. And that's what many of the early church fathers, including Justin, our subject, did. Of course, he's Justin Martyr. That wasn't his last name, but he was one of the first martyrs for the faith. He was actually wrote several apologies. Again, our modern ears kind of hear that, but it's kind of like an essay making defense for the hope that is in him. He even wrote to many leaders, secular leaders, including the Roman emperor. One instance was that the Christians were an asset and they should be respected and treated as full citizens. They weren't a problem. They weren't going to be a burden And you have to remember, this is the second century, after about 100 years or so after Christ ascended. Christianity is not accepted at all. It's actually very, uh, it's it's been hostile, or it's, it's seen as hostile by the Roman world. Much of it has grown, and yet it's still very much illegal. There's an account in 132, so a couple years after coming to Christ, he goes to Ephesus, where we'll see Paul here in a moment in our text. But he's teaching and debating with another Jewish philosopher, again, similar to what Paul's doing, named Trypho. And he talks about three things. This is Justin. Says how the old covenant is passing away, and the new is coming, and the new is here. Number two, the Logos, which we see in John chapter 1. Logos was kind of this like Greek wisdom idea, is actually Christ, which is affirmed in John. And that the Gentiles are the new Israel. These are his three points. Now, he was a student of Polycarp, who was a bishop, a leader in, in a local church in Smyrna, and who was directly taught by John the Apostle. So three generations, right? John, Polycarp, Justin. So very, very close to the Apostles. We see Paul in Ephesus here doing something similar. We saw last week, right, he was in the synagogue for a few months, got kicked out, then he rented, you know, a college classroom, the Hall of Tyrannus, and he was there for two years, Reasoning and arguing with the people about Christ being the Messiah, being better, the one who is to come, the one who is here, the one who we should trust and turn to. 
And yet Paul did that about 80 years prior to Justin doing the same thing in the same city. So if you don't mind standing, one more time. We're going to look at Ephesus and what Paul is doing with these sons of Sceva. I'm going to back up to verse 11, chapter 19, and we'll pray and dive into our text. And God was doing extraordinary miracles at the hands of Paul, and that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them. And many evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus who Paul proclaims. Seven sons of the Jewish high priest named Sceva, or Siva, were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them. So they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord was extolled. And many, also many that had become now believers, confessing, came confessing and divulging their practices. A number of those who had practiced magical arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, that they counted the value of them and found that it was about 50,000 pieces of silver, so that the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Pray with me. Father, thank you again for this section, Lord, of The Holy Spirit prompting Luke to write down these things. You have these things here for a reason. There's other things you didn't write down, but you want us thousands of years later to know them. Help us to understand what's going on in the text and how it applies to us today, Lord. May my words be your words in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. Thank you. So two points. Two points. Imposters exploit Jesus, that's the first point, 13 through 16, and believers extol Jesus. Imposters exploit, believers extol. And you're like, what's extol? We'll get there. We'll get there. You might already know it. You're looking it up right now on your phone. But we see this, and there's, again, an, an entrance that's like, this is weird, right? Another weird instance in the Bible. But let's remember, the Bible has lots of weird stuff. But that makes it good. (laughs) If it was all cookie cutter and squared away and totally human, well, then we would have a lot of suspicion, right? But God doesn't do things the way we think he should do them. And he certainly doesn't do things the way we do things, right? You can look at all the other world religions and realize they're all just a bunch of works because that's what humans do. It's like, well, I'll be a better person. You know, I'll give more money. I'll serve more. I'll, I'll... hurt myself. I'll do this or that. Well, that's not reality. That's not how you're actually saved. That's not how you're actually washed and how you're actually renewed. It's repenting of your sin and turning to Christ. Nothing in you, nothing in me, but everything in Christ. And yet people still exploit it. People do it today. We'd be here all day if we talked about all the charlatans and hucksters on TV and on the internet who exploit Jesus. I won't get into them. I mention them often. But we see here, and this is not the first time we've seen demon spirit sorcerer guys trying to do something. Verse 13 specifically says some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus. So stop there. Itinerant, similar to my, our story of Justin, martyr, who was under an itinerant philosopher. All times people would travel around. Remember, there's no cars, there's no electricity. They would just travel around doing this and that. They'd teach for a fee and whatever. No doubt these guys made money, right? There's seven guys. And even if it's just them and they don't have families, it's still, you got to feed yourself. And so whatever they do or have been doing, I would imagine is working to a degree. But then they see this Paul guy Who's doing these other things? And what does it just stay right before this? God was doing extraordinary miracles. Notice it's God doing it. Not Paul. 
Paul's not selling it in a little table out. Hey, you know, come get my handkerchiefs. I got some handkerchiefs here. Hey, hey. You know, kind of doing stuff on the side of the road. No, people, for whatever reason, God is using these things. Extraordinary miracles, not just miracles, but extraordinary. So extra, bigger, more unique, as if a miracle is not already unique enough. And so this is the context that these people are getting sick and evil spirits leaving. So then they're like, huh, he's having success with just little fabrics. And he talks about this Jesus, and we're Jewish and Hebrew, and even in this culture in Ephesus. Remember, we're not in Israel. We're not in, in Jerusalem. We're in Ephesus, far, far away. There's maps in the back if you want to grab. I should have said that earlier, but they are in the, in the entryway. We're far west. So this is a secular city, quarter million people. Right? This is Las Vegas. This is New York. This is very not at all Bible belty Christian anything, if you want to put it in our context. But these people are still seen, the Jewish guys, as having this kind of like posture of like, hey, we're holy. Right? And a lot of the Greeks see them and think, oh, they're, they're special. They, they worship this, 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 this true God, this, this other God. We worship a lot of gods. but And that's kind of the, the aura of this. And that's how a lot of these guys, a lot of these, especially Jewish guys, whether they were true followers of Yahweh or not, probably not, just kind of Jewish by ethnicity. But either way, they're still seen as they're special. And so, therefore, they can kind of trick people and use their incantations, their little magical spells. And that's what they're trying to do here. Paul's working, and they think, hey, let's try that. A little pragmatism here. Well, Simon Magus in Acts 8, 9 through 10 does that too, doesn't he? We saw that months ago with Philip. And he says, hey, give me, I want some of that power. Give me some of that. I'll buy it from you. Can you buy salvation? No. Can you buy even the ability to cast out a demon. No, <laughs> right? And nowhere in the scripture, whether you believe that still happens or not today, either way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't happen even then. It's, it's not even possible in the text then. Acts 16, 16 through 19, same thing. These are on the notes there. The slave girl, spirit of divination. And what's fascinating, what does she say, if you remember? She's saying, these men are proclaiming the way of salvation. And she's demon-possessed. Like, what? And it, again, a fun part. This is fun and weird, our text. But that text, if you remember, what does it say? Paul is greatly annoyed. <laughs> and then he casts the demon out, right? It goes on for a week, and he's like, ah, just, you're messing us up. Just be gone, right? And he casts the demon out. Not in his name, but in Christ's name. There's other instances. We see Luke 4.41 and James 2.19. Both mention Jesus knowing, or both mention demons knowing Jesus. Excuse me. But these imposters, they don't. They don't really. They don't really care. They're itinerant. They're traveling around, and they say by the name of Jesus. But it's not this personal, like Paul has done, or you know, we see John and uh, uh, Peter in the temple when they heal in Jesus' name the the crippled man at the temple there. It's just this kind of like adjacent sort of like, yeah, G just Jesus, as if it's just a word, not a person. That's why it doesn't work. Right? I adjure you by the Jesus who Paul proclaims. Verse 14 says there, the Jewish seven sons. Verse 15, the evil spirit answered them. We don't always get an answer from an evil spirit, but oftentimes we do, and it's very, very interesting Anytime you see and maybe do your own personal study, I don't think we'll ever get to it, but looking at what a de demonic response is either to Christ or the apostles, or even this instance here, they're not apostles, but what the demons say, and as I just said a moment ago, that many of these people, many of these demons know Christ. They know about him. They don't know him in a physical way relational way, spiritual way. It's just I know about him. Like we know about the president or the governor or maybe that person down the road, that teacher, that coworker. You just know them. You know their name. You see them. But you don't know them like your husband or your wife or even your children. It's a different knowledge. So this is serious, but it's also kind of funny too, right? Because, again, demon possessions... 
a serious matter. But he answers and says, I, don't, I know Jesus. Paul, I recognize. They're different words. It's I'm familiar with Paul. I know, I know who Jesus is. If you think about the Gospels, you're probably thinking of some references like, you are the Holy One of God, right? Or that demon girl who says they're proclaiming the way of salvation in Acts 16. But then they say, who are you? <laughs> Which is just, I don't know, I find that humorous. I listen to the Bible app and it's, it's audio sometimes. and I always, Those get tattooed in my mind. And then they play back. I'm not going to act it out for you, but it'd be, you know, there, some of these instances, they're very, like the demons are very like graphic -y demon voices and the people are like running and, and anyway, it's, it's better than what I'm reading right here. But anyway, I won't act, I won't act, I won't act it out for you. 16, the man in whom the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all them and overpowered them. And so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So this, these guys, these imposters, they get exactly what they deserve, right? Pretending to be these pious Jewish, you know, Skiba and Sons exorcism, kind of like a CPA or a law firm or something. Like, you know, Skiba and Sons, like, hey, we go around. You got a demon problem? You know, we'll help you out. I don't know what they're doing. But whatever it is, they're doing the fee, they're doing the thing, and they've probably done something to make it work in the past, so like, hey, there's this new Jesus name. Let's do that. Well, did they succeed? No. But this is all the background of the quarter million population city of Ephesus that also has one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis. It was built in 550 B.C., about 600 years or so before this incident. This temple had many statues, and in those statues, there were carvings and engravings with incantations, little kind of gibberish writings. Many of these papyri have been found as well from the 2nd and 3rd century. Same type of thing. One says, I abjure, abjure, not adjure, but abjure thee by Jesus, the God of the Hebrews. This is one that's been found. There's others that speak about the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there's kind of these like weird gibberishy type things that really don't make any sense. But somehow, some way, kind of like a Ouija board today or some sort of convening with demons, and we won't get into demonology really, but there is a supernatural world. And in our culture, we often just kind of gloss over it. It's just kind of sterilized. Eh, I don't know. That was weird. Those are weird. Those, eh. But make no mistake, I believe personally, the things when people see aliens or ghosts or whatever, and I've said this before, those are demonic powers. Those are tricksters because after all, their father is the father of lies, right? So if you can trick people into thinking they're seeing space aliens or their great-grandfather, instead of worshiping Christ, it doesn't matter. Satan doesn't care. He's, he comes to kill and destroy. He comes to take down, not to build up, right? And so it doesn't matter if someone's going to follow this or that. Whereas if you go to Southeast Asia or Africa, they have ancestor worship. Or they've, I've heard many stories from missionaries and others of people calling down healing spirits and instantly things happen and screams and stuff out in the open and just darkness comes over people like physically, like the lights on in the bedroom and the, but yet there's no light and they're like oppressed and pushed down and spiritual entities, supernatural powers are real. And it's not just real in this text and no longer real today. Of course, it's still real today. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not real. But somehow, someway, these guys and other people were casting out demons or doing something before this. And so they tried this new Jesus trick. But it doesn't work. Kind of like a spiritual steroids. They're hearing this like Simon Magus. Give me some more of that. I want... I want something new, something exciting. And to a degree, we do that today, too. Many people in the world do that, right? But we might do it, too. We might think, well, I want something more. Give me something a little more from the Bible. And sadly, there's many groups that, well, i got to speak in tongues. Well, i got to do this. Well, I want to see this. Well, you know, uh, I want God to speak to me physically, audibly. But if you want God to speak to you, read the Bible, right? <laughs> like, this is God's Word. And that's why it's called God's Word, because it's God's Word. So when we hear from God, we hear from him in his word. 
So don't crave, that's kind of one little side application, don't crave more. I know life's boring a lot of times, right? And we want excitement, we want adventure, we want more things. But don't crave those things, because it usually doesn't end well. And you're usually not satisfied with what you get. We see in Luke 4.36, by the way, that the power isn't not in Christ, because the power is in Christ. We see that it says that they all were amazed What is this word they're asking themselves about Jesus? This is in Luke 4. For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. So notice again, it's not that Jesus' name didn't work in this incantation. It's not backed up by any sort of trust or faith. It's empty. And really, that's the application for us. If it's a mere facade, if your Christianity is just kind of like out there and you just come to church and that makes you a Christian or something, you, you've got another thing coming. That's not true. And for children, children here close, this is the same thing for adults as well. You're not a Christian because of your parents. You have to trust Jesus on your own. You have to say, I'm a sinner, I need a savior. You don't become a Christian by going to church or reading the Bible or from your parents Oh, well, my great-grandfather was a pastor. My dad's a pastor. No. You have to confess. You have to turn. And then when you do, you give that burden, those sins to the Lord. And you walk with him. And that goes for us, too, as adults. I know some of us have been walking with the Lord for a long time. Others far less. But either way, it's this called sanctification. Right? Fancy word, we're being renewed and refined. We're killing our sin. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Not on our own, because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, our bodies are a temple. But at the same time, we're not called to just lay down and say, Oh, yeah, anything and everything is fine. Let me see if I can conjure up some demons. (laughs) Let me see if I can do this Sons of Sceva thing and, you know, cast out. See if this whole supernatural thing is real, like my pastor was talking about. Don't do it. (laughs) That's That's a side note. Don't do that. I've never experienced it. I don't really want to. But the things I hear about, there's always this entity and a lot of the demonic powers and even fake religions of the world, they all have one thing in common is you have to be willing. So if you're not willing, church, you're not going to be worried about like, oh, I'm going to be demon possessed all of a sudden. I've got a relative. She's always concerned about that. I'm not kidding. And that's fine. But like, if you've got the Holy Spirit... Don't worry about it. Now, if you're saying, oh, I'm going to open the door and say, hey, I'm going to see about this whole supernatural thing that's not of the Lord. Well, that's a different story. But don't do that. Don't do that. Please. At the end of the day, similar to these guys, don't exploit Jesus. Right. And that's, again, kind of the main message for us now. Don't exploit Christ. Don't think, well, I'm a Christian because I go here on this or I gave money or You know, I signed a card or something like that. No, you have a relationship with Christ through faith in him alone. And that's it, right? It's never about what you're doing or making your works. Yes, you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And then what's the next verse? And you're saved. Saved from destruction. Saved from the penalty of sin and death. Saved from your own self. So don't be like these sons of Sceva who exploit Christ the name of Christ, rather extol him, lift him up, which is our next point, 17 through 20. This account makes people afraid. And I mean, raise your hand if you wouldn't be afraid, right? Like pretty, I mean, seven grown men are ripped to shreds as far as both being beat up and naked. Of course, of course, that's very shameful in the Jewish culture, especially, but, you know, even in Ephesus probably wasn't the best thing. Seven dudes, not like one on one or two on one, seven on one, and a guy masters them all. I'd be fearful, at least of that guy, right? I'd be fearful of going anywhere near that guy's house or wherever he was. But this is something we see. We know the, the demon man where he rips the chains, right? Just kind of tears them to bits in the Gospels. There's other accounts of demonic powers being strong. I'd be scared. I think you would be too. And the one thing is, 
I mean, fear is one of those things that's talked about so often, and I know it was even sung in the special. But it, the difference is, where is our fear placed? And that's the second point we're really looking at. Luke 12, 5, Jesus is saying, I show you whom you may fear. Fear him who, after the killing, is having authority to cast into Gehenna. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Some translations say hell, but Gehenna's Greek, it's basically like the outer dump, the, the fiery pits outside of Jerusalem. Psalm 39, 4 says, O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is none want to them that fear him. If you fear God, you're set. Better is a little with fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Now, a lot of people, and maybe some of our friends or closest neighbors or people on Facebook, you know, progressive Christians, they call themselves. Probably really just unbelievers, but anyway. They would say, why would you want a God fear? Oh, that's backwards. Oh, that's, that's not loving. That's not tolerant. That's, we believe in a God of acceptance. God of love. Why would you want a God that fe- you, you fear? Well, because the Bible talks about it like hundreds of times. And we see the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom as one of many examples, as I just read. So we can't just go with like our modern parlance of words called fear or others. But rather, we need to understand who we're fearing, right? Don't fear death. Don't fear man. Don't fear the loss of job or the loss of money. Fear God. Why? Because he's God, because he's the creator, and he's good. It reminds me of the story in Narnia, you might know it, the youngest of the four children that go through the magical wardrobe, and she's there, and there's you know, talking animals and people, and they're talking, and Lucy, the youngest, is talking to Mr. Beaver. Again, you might know the story, and she, of course, thinks Aslan's a man. Aslan's is coming back, and everything's going to change, and it's going to be better, and of course, Aslan's a picture of Christ. And she finds out that Aslan's actually a lion. And she says, well, he's a lion. Hold on. Like, is he, is, he, is he safe? And, of course, Mr. Beaver laughs. He says, he's not safe. He's a lion. But he's good. That's the difference. And the God we worship, the God of reality, the God of the Holy Scripture is good. It's not a capricious God like the Muslims worship. A God who may or may not love you on the day of your death. There's no assurance. There's no hope. He's not a sinful God. He's not a broken God. He's a complete God, a holy God. And that's one of the attributes of the word holy. Remember, he's holy, 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 thrice holy. Holy means separate, set apart, outside. God is outside of the creation, which makes it all the more loving and amazing that he entered the cursed creation. Right? All the more amazing that he didn't just sit back and say, idiots, I send this and I do this and I do this. I'm done. He could have. He didn't have to give us revelation. He didn't have to give us prophets. He didn't have to give us apostles. And he certainly didn't have to add flesh to himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of human flesh, being so whipped, so torn to shreds, And yet he was still obedient, even to the point of death on a cross. Not just death, not just murder, oh, he was beat up. Death on a cross, the most heinous, wicked, most embarrassing way to die. Because of love. Because of justice. This is why he did it. He didn't have to. And so people see this. And this is what Paul is doing, and that's what I hope we do, and that's what I hope we live, is that how Jesus is our religion. He is the one and object of our worship, because he's worthy. Or as I sometimes say, he's better, and this is another example of that. And we see this here, that they get scared. Verse 17, verse 18, back to our text. But many of those were now believers. Notice that. There's fear, and the fear leads to knowledge of the truth. That they say, oh, this is power. This is different. This isn't the normal, you know, Greek gods that we worship. This isn't Artemis who's just, 
you know, kind of a whole cult and weird stuff that we're not really super into, but we kind of have to go along with it. No, this is power. This is might. This is love. This is something different. So they're now believers, verse 18 says. And confessing, right? Romans 10, 9, confess through their mouth. They're confessing and divulging their practices. Other translations say declaring their deeds, telling their deeds, publicly admitting, revealing. I like the contemporary English version. I don't use it often, but I thought it was really good here. That verse in this, or that translation says, many who were followers now started telling everyone about the evil things they had been doing. Because these incantations, these books, it wasn't just, hey, uh, you know, I'm going to get rid of some of my DVDs or my, my books or whatever. Or, you know, I'm not going to go there anymore. Like, they were, this was their job. Right? This, was, this is what they did. Their sorcery. They're doing these things. This is their livelihood. And so they had these books. They didn't sell it and say, well, we'll give it to the poor. These are, these are worth a lot of money. I mean, I can't just, like, get rid of them. Right? Like, uh, no, they burned it. 50,000 pieces of silver or denarii. Depending on your translation. Point is a lot of money, right? Those who had practiced magic arts brought their books. They burned them in the sight of all. Notice that exclusivity, that totality, that we're burning these things in the presence of everyone. It's not hidden. It's not, oh, I love Jesus, but I'm not going to tell anybody. It's my money. It's my stuff. No. They say, this is a new life. You're changed. You're different. These aren't just books. Again, they're some sort of wicked, you know, witchy type of incantational spells. Magical arts, dark arts. And really, I mean, that's the title of this message. I haven't said it yet, but I saw it now. This is what Jesus overcomes. The Jesus overcomes the darkness. Not just darkness of sin, but darkness in a practical sense. But we have to remember that men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. That's what happens. Because you love the darkness. We love like little cockroaches. You turn on the light, they run away. Right? Or rats. Darkness is just the absence of light. As soon as light comes in, it always wins. It always chases away the darkness. Both spiritually and even physically, right? The sun is out. It's never going to be night. Uh, don't talk about eclipses. That's not, that's not the point. <laughs> right? Light and dark they're not only physical, but they're also illustrative. We see this in the Gospel of John, many other places. Christ is better. He is the light. The true light that comes into, light, into the world is giving light to every man, John 1 says. He was the light. He is the light. The light of the life of men. The light shines in the darkness, it says. On and on. And that's just the first few verses of John. So this is not just a physical thing, not just an agreeance. Yeah, okay, I'm a sinner. But these people here, they're confessing, divulging. Hey, we're doing wicked things. Christ is different. He's changed me. Things are, things are new. I don't know what this looks like, but I'm a different person. But that all requires us to acknowledge first our sin before a holy God. If you haven't done that, do that. Turn to Christ. Whatever sin you're holding on to isn't worth it. It's just not. Whatever, I mean, these people, 50,000 pieces of silver, that's, that's like a year's wage. Maybe more, depending on where you are. It's a lot of money. And oh, they burn it, they're done, it's gone. And it really just kind of takes us again, extracting this, where are we here? How does this work for us? How does this apply? Have you already done that? Again, like I said, many of you have been walking with Christ for a long time. Have you burned those books? Are they gone? Are they still kind of tucked away? Maybe just, just every so often. Just a little, eh, maybe. Just a little sample of my BC days. If you have not, I don't know, I don't know what they are. Maybe you don't even know what they are. But at minimum, I want each of us to call to the Holy Spirit and say, show me the books, metaphorically, 
Maybe they're actually books, right? Maybe they're DVDs. Maybe it's the money that I'm always clinging to or the money I'm giving to someone else that I now should give to a pregnancy center or Sunrise Children's Services. Something else. Whatever it is, we need to know. And he, he knows. The Holy Spirit, he knows. I don't know. I don't want to know, really. Cry out to him. Call to him and say, what are the books that I need to burn? What are the things that need to go up and smoke? That I need to say, enough, I'm done. Even if you're a believer and you're still clinging to those scraps, still maybe limping along in your sanctification, not actually following the Lord, walking with him the way that he wants you to, freely, fully, letting the word of the Lord increase in your life, in this local body, in Grayson County, within your family, whatever. But I guarantee you at least one of you has that. One of you, or more, maybe people listening, has those books that are tucked away deep down, and they're just, ah, this is just in case. Burn them. Get rid of them. And like I said, maybe they're actually books. Maybe it's something else. But ultimately, the Holy Spirit knows. Call to him. Cry out to him. That's what we can learn from this text for us. In the last verse, and we'll close with this. Verse 20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. If you're still thinking, oh, I don't know though. It's worth a lot of money. What if I need it? What's the right, what's the right, what, right before? And they counted the value of them, 50,000 pieces of silver. They burned the books. And they say, we're done. We're following Jesus. 50,000 pieces of silver. They didn't, Luke didn't have to put that in there. And then the next verse, and they really missed their stuff. Is that what it says? And they were really uh, sad. They, 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 they went to the ashes and they were hoping to find that. No. They said, we're done. We're moving on. We're turning. That's what repentance is. Remember, you're turning. You're going this way and you're physically turning. It's a mental thing. But then there's belief. And that's always repent and believe. It's not just one or the other. You can't just believe like the demons believe and not repent, right? Or just mentally try and work yourself up and be a good person, quote unquote, but not believe that Jesus is your Lord. Yeah, you can clean up your life, quit drinking, quit doing this, quit doing that, whatever. Quit cursing, blah, 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 fine. But that's only going to get you so far. Unless you believe that Jesus is the Son of God who takes away your sin and makes you new and declares you justified, it's all for naught. And to give us confidence, Luke puts in, through the Spirit, so the word of the Lord continued to increase. And just for extra, prevail mightily. Not just prevail, but mightily. Extra. Like at the start of verse 11. Extraordinary miracles. Notice just the little details. This should give you confidence, church. Burn the books. If you have them. And if they're gone, great, praise God. But if you know someone else who has those books, urge them. Books, you know, metaphorical, quote unquote. They might be books. I don't know. Hopefully they're not magical books. I mean, if they are, definitely burn those. But anyway. But call out to the Lord. Call out to the Spirit. Show me. What are they? Because you might be blinded. You might not even know. You might have forgotten. The word of the Lord will prevail mightily. When we give these things to him, let's pray. God, help us to know that you do overcome the darkness. Help us to not exploit you, Lord, but rather extol you, magnify you, glorify you. That's what extol means, to lift you up. Because you are worthy. You are worthy of honor and praise, even as half of the book of Revelation says, so much glory and worship are there. Worshiping the Son, the Lamb who was slain for sinners. The great Lion of Judah. Jesus, be with us, Lord. Help us to remember that your sacrifice that even while we were sinners, you died for us. We didn't clean up our lives. We didn't make ourselves better.
but rather we confessed with our mouth and believe that you are the Son of God. You are the Savior. You are the one who redeems us from the pit, from hell and death, and brings us into glory. May we call to you. May you show each of us if we have those books metaphorically, maybe physically, and we will give them up. We will burn them and get rid of them that we may walk more holy, devout unto you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right.